Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and inspire your future. For more information about our church, please visit us at ourjourney.church. Yeah, we are so glad you tuned in. Welcome to Journey Church, and I want to introduce to you a good friend of mine. I had the wonderful opportunity to uh, meet this young man and just, uh, you know, you ever meet someone and in your spirit you just click? And so uh, we've just built a wonderful relationship, and I was just biting at the chomp to get him to come and, and introduce him to you because I just love the work that he's doing in Katie's. I believe in his ministry and what he's doing there at One Church. And so I want us all across this place, let's stand to our feet, give a round of applause to Pastor John Groves. Thank you so much, Pastor. Well, good morning. How many of you are excited to be at church this morning? That's, that's pretty good. I, I appreciate Pastor Vince and Pastor Jared for allowing me to be here today. And, uh, you know, you all have an incredible lead pastor. I was about three people really appreciate you. Um, you, uh, you, you, you. I've traveled all around the country for most of my life and been in thousands of churches. And it is unusual to find a church that actually loves the Lord and who has a pastor with a vision to do new things and to reach many people. So how many of you are excited that Pastor Vince, God led him here? Amen. Amen. Hey, I want you to do something this morning. We're just going to divide the room right here in half. And I want everybody on this side of the room to look over here, find somebody, just stare them and find, look at their eyeballs, pick them out. You can point at them if you want to. It won't be rude just for a second. So everybody over here, find somebody. Y'all, y'all find your person over here. And then everybody on this side of the room, here's what I want you to say. I want you to say, I want God to do something new in me today. All right, now everybody over here, they just picked you out and they looked at you. So I want you to look back at them, okay? You ready? Everybody over here, look over at the folks on this side of the room and say this to them. You need it. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm excited to be here with you today, excited to be at Journey Church. It's great to, be, to see uh, God's family over here in Hopkinsville, and we consider you our, our brothers and sisters and our partners in ministry uh, over in uh, Cadiz. And so this morning, I want to spend the next few minutes uh, kind of debunking a myth that the church has told for just decades about a man by the name of Moses and as we begin to uncover this truth and debunk this myth that has been preached from pulpits and taught in Sunday school and even shared in conversation, as we debunk this myth in today's episode of Mythbusters Journey Church Edition, uh, we're going to discover a truth about ourselves that if we'll apply it and if we'll live it out, it will change not only our perspective and our attitude today, but it's going to change the remainder of our lives. It's going to help us to reach more people. One of the truths that I want us to see this morning is this. I can do more than people expect when I listen to the truth about who God says that I am. I can do more than people expect when I listen to the truth about who God says I am. So this morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Acts in chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And as you're turning there, I want to say welcome to all of our friends at Journey Church Online. We're so glad that you're here. And so as you scroll over to Acts chapter 7, we're going to start reading in verse 17. Here's what the Bible says. But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, look at your neighbor and say, at this time. At this time, Moses was born. And he was beautiful in God's sight, and he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty. Everybody say mighty. mighty. Come on, say it like you're awake this morning. Mighty. mighty. He was mighty in words and deeds. 
When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, your brothers, why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? And this retort, at this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. So at this point in the history of the Israelite nation, we know that Joseph has brought them into the land of Egypt many, many years before until a king comes on the scene, a Pharaoh who doesn't know the story of Joseph and frankly he doesn't care. What he begins to notice is that within the borders of his nation, there's a group of people who do not belong to him that are about three million men strong. They did not count the women and the children at this point in history. So we know that this is a nation that is exceedingly large and multiplying and growing in strength every single day. And as this king begins to look around, he sees this group of people that are growing inside the borders of his nation and it begins to strike fear into his heart. Because these people are not responsible to him. They are not from the same race as him. They're a different people group with different ideals and different standards and different practices. So rather than cast them out and rather than to allow them to exist within his own nation, he enslaves the people of Israel. Now, at this time, he decides that he is going to put a stop to the growth of this nation. So he makes a decree that the midwives and the soldiers should go into the homes and murder every baby boy that was born. To kill them, to put a stop or to put a slow on the growth of this nation. Now, what we saw in this passage of scripture is that this is a terrible time. For the nation of Israel, this is a tragic time for the growth of the people. And they're now in slavery, they're in bondage. This is not the promised land. This is not the place where God wants them to be. And so at a moment in history when things were looking down for the children of Israel and at a moment when it was exceedingly dangerous to have born into your family a baby boy, at this time Moses was born. This morning I want you to know something, whether you've been in church for a long time or you're here this morning because someone invited you and you're just checking it out. You're not a Christian and you don't know that you believe all of this faith stuff yet. I want you to know something. God's timing is always perfect. God's timing is always perfect and sometimes we look at the way that God begins to develop seasons in our lives and we look at the way that God begins to introduce answers and we say, but God, this timing doesn't make any sense. God, I don't see that this is going to be effective, but listen, as for God, his way is perfect. As for God, his timing is always accurate. And at a time when you and I would not have placed the deliverer of the nation, God placed him at this time of danger so that they could see the miraculous and the all-powerful hand of God at work in their lives. You can imagine the fear that Moses' parents would have been encountering because they looked at this baby boy and they saw that he was fair, that he was good. And of course, as you in the room that are parents this morning understand, they had a deep, deep love for this baby that was their son. And so for three months, they begin to hide him. But I know one thing to be true, and all of the parents can say amen to this this morning. The stress that would have filled their hearts day by day as the soldiers would have come through inspecting to see if any baby boys had been born. The stress that would have filled their heart because I, I, I have siblings, they're all younger than me and I know one thing to be abundantly true. You could be in a massive house and one dirty diaper will make that whole thing smell bad. You can be in a big old room and one baby can ruin everything. One child can change the whole uh, temperature of the entire place. The whole atmosphere can be spoiled. I know that my mother had to make all kinds of those little things of potpourri because I had one little brother that he wasn't like, 
he was the opposite of popery. His presence in the room was like poopery all through the all through the house. And so as the soldiers come through, they're just praying, "Oh God, please don't let that. Please don't let that. Please don't let baby Moses do anything. Let, Lord, don't let him cry. Lord, if the soldiers smell that, they're going to know it's not us. God, would would you please? You know, the stress begins to fill their heart, and so they just don't know what else to do. So they they make this basket and they place baby Moses into this basket. And you know the story. It just so happened because God's timing is perfect. That as Moses was floating there in the body of water in this basket, that Pharaoh's daughter happens to come to the body of water. God's timing is perfect. And men, you'll understand that ladies, they can be carrying on a perfectly intelligible conversation with you. I mean, speaking regular normal words in regular normal tone until a baby enters the room. And all of a sudden, this lady that is conversing with you just like I am right now begins to shift to, well, and then we, oh my goodness, let me just have some of You know, and they make noises and sounds that I do not understand. And so I imagine that Pharaoh's daughter is the one, her dad is the one who made the decree that this baby boy is not to even be in existence. But as she steps down to the body of water and she sees that basket, which I don't know about you, friend, but I would have avoided that thing. It sounds like the crocodile hunter. Y'all ever watch him? Like, he, he, you'd see him on TV, you know, that's a killer mamba snake and one touch and it'll bite your face off. I'm going to poke it with a stick, you know. I'm like, no, let's run away from that. But she begins to inch out into this body of water and she opens the lid of this basket and she looks in and she, all of a sudden everything changes. Dad, can I please get this baby? Can I please? I'll take it. She, Dad, I'll, I'll love it as my own and I'll feed it and I'll walk it. Dad, please, please let me keep this baby. And so the heart of Pharaoh was softened because God placed his daughter in the right place at the right time. And so Pharaoh was raised, Moses was raised up in the house of Pharaoh. The Bible says he was mighty in words and in deeds. But one day, after 40 years, it came into his heart to visit his brothers. Because as he began to look around, he knew he was different than them. And I would bet that as his mother was paid to raise him, isn't it amazing that the one who would destroy the Egyptian government was raised up in the Egyptian government and the government paid the bill. But he's raised up in this house and he knows there's something different. He sees that there's a difference. He knows. In fact, the Bible says that he thought they would have understood how that God would use him to deliver them. You see, Moses has had an encounter with God where God has communicated to him, I'm going to use you to deliver your family. But for 40 years, he stays in the shadows under the roof of the castle there. And it came into his heart. Because I want you to know something. You can run and you can wait. In fact, you can wait 40 years. But you will never be able to escape the calling that God has placed on your life. You can try and do different things. You can try and run. You can attempt to do anything else because sometimes the calling that God places on us is a little bit scary. I'm here to tell you that you can attempt it. You can try it and you don't have to be a teenager to sin. You could be 80, 90 years old in the room this morning and running from the calling of God. But know this, God will not allow you to rest and he will not give you supernatural peace until you're living in that calling. And so it comes into his heart and he visits on the first day and he sees an Egyptian beating one of his own and so he kills the Egyptian, he buries him in the sand and he goes back on day number two. Now Moses, his situation is kind of like one that I grew up in. I grew up on the road in full-time evangelism. My dad traveled in evangelism so we lived on a 45-foot entertainer coach that you see driving through Nashville all the time and uh, when people ask, where are you from? I say, I'm from Walmart, because that's where I spent the most collective time. And so, growing up, we'd go to, we'd go to Walmart in between revival meetings and different things. And my dad, um, I used to be really shy and introverted, and my dad is the opposite of that, the epitome of that dad that you don't take anywhere because he'll embarrass you. And we'd go into Walmart, and as a kid, he started teaching me Walmart games, because we were bored, we lived on a bus, so we'd go into Walmart and play Walmart games. And he'd walk in. We had a competition to see who could get uh, the weirdest thing in someone's cart that they would actually buy. I, I'll tell you that I'm the one who won, but it's church, and I can't tell you what I snuck into somebody's cart. But then we, we switched it to see who could get the largest thing in someone's cart that they would actually buy. Bennett, my dad won it. He got a whole case of water on someone's cart. And they made it to the checkout line, and they're like, oh, I guess I need this. And they bought it on there. 
My, my dad would do weird things. He would go stand like right in the middle of the aisle where everybody's trying to go check out and he would just freeze like a statue. And if you stand there long enough, Bennett, eventually an employee is going to come up to you and say, Sir, are you okay? My dad would go, You can see me? <laughs> in fact, I think I was like 17 or 18 years old. He, he, uh, he paid me to go sit on that bench that was by the, the photography section in the back. And I curled up in the fetal position and began rocking back and forth. And eventually someone said, sir, are you okay? And I went, can you help me find my mom? You know, just, you just mess with people. And you say, that's weird. Why would you do that? Well, my dad said, that's hundreds of thousands of people go in and out of Walmart every day. What are the chances that the same people are going to be back tomorrow? These people are never going to see you again. So don't worry about it. Just live it up. And we say, dad, that's embarrassing. He'd say, don't worry about it. These people are never going to see you ever again. So don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. They, they won't remember you in 10 years. And I'm sure that Moses is thinking the same thing. Three million strong. I'm going to go back on day two. What are the chances that someone happened to witness it? But God's timing is always perfect. God had placed something in Moses' heart. And so now we find him separating two of his brothers. And someone says, who made you the boss of us? In fact, I saw you yesterday. And the Bible says that Moses flees into the wilderness at this saying. Friends, your words have power. Your words have power to propel people in the right direction or to send them plummeting in the wrong direction. Every little word that you speak has great potential and great power. Be cautious what you say and likewise be cautious of the voices that you listen to. Because this man who the Bible says was mighty in word and in deed flees into the wilderness at this saying. And while I know that I can do more than people expect when I listen to the truth about who God says I am. I know that God has placed something in my heart that I just can't seem to get away from. So this morning we asked the question, why do I run? Why is it that I run from the calling of God? Why is it that it seems like daily in my Christian walk, I, I, I'm running in the opposite direction of where God has placed me? I'm here to tell you that no matter what saying I've heard, or no matter what situation you may face, God has a way of meeting you right where you're at. And that's what we see in Exodus chapter 3, if you want to turn there. Exodus chapter 3, the story of Moses continues in verse 1. The Bible says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush and he says this, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. So Moses is walking through the wilderness, but notice he's here at Horeb, the mountain of God. But he's not looking for the things of God. And one Bible scholar suggests that the miracle of the burning bush was not that it had caught on fire in Moses' presence but that Moses had been past this place several different times and that the bush had always been on fire, that God's presence had been there at Horeb on the mountain of God waiting for Moses to notice and to turn aside to see what God was doing. So Moses does this. He begins to walk toward this bush, forsaking all of the flock, and God begins to speak to him from out of this flame. And he says this, Moses, Moses. Now, you that are note takers, write this down. This is important. Any time that you find a name used twice in, in a row, Moses, Moses, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Isaac, any time that you find a name used twice, that is symbolic in their culture and in their grammatical context of a covenant that has previously been made. When you use somebody's name twice in a row, that was God's way of reminding them of a promise that he had already given them. Moses already knew what God wanted him to do, but he's hiding in the wilderness. Moses already knew that God wanted to use him to deliver his people, but he's running away from the calling of God because of something that a slave said. And so now God speaks to him and he calls him. He says, Moses, Moses, and he says, take off your shoes. Why would God ask him to do that? 
You see, in Old Testament culture, when it was time to sign a contract, there wasn't always papyrus or tablet available to carve that out or to write it out. And so when there was an exchange, when there was an exchange of uh, goods or even an exchange of a person, as you read in the book of Ruth, the person who was signing the contract would take off a shoe off their foot and give it to the other person as a symbol. But God says, I don't want just one shoe. I want you to put off both shoes. Why is that? Because while one shoe is the way of signing a contract, in this culture, a man's feet are the source of his authority. If you can't walk, you cannot work, you cannot provide, you cannot do, you cannot travel. You have no authority. You are a beggar if you cannot walk. And so when God says, I want you to take both of your shoes off, what he is saying to Moses symbolically is, Moses, I want your authority. Because Moses was mighty in words and in deeds. He's a master negotiator. He's a master communicator. He's not just an okay talker. He's an amazing speaker. He's not just a regular dude. He's mighty in deed. He has been raised in the scientific and cultural and literary capital of the world at this time. He has everything that someone could possibly need. He's a man's man. But God says, I don't want any of that. I'm not looking for superpowers. What I'm looking for, Moses, is surrender. And I'm here to tell you in the church this morning that when God tells you to do something, when God places a vision and a mission in your heart, the things that God has commanded us to to do in the pages of his word. It doesn't take superpowers to fulfill God's will. It takes surrender to the calling of God. And God will not take you to something that he will not push you through. The Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which gives me strength. Amen. At my church, they get excited and they sometimes they clap and they say amen. And I tell them that the more responsive you are, the faster I'll preach. The less responsive you are, the longer I'll go. Amen. Amen. <laughs> When God gives you purpose, do not hide from it. Don't let it pass you by. When God speaks, he expects us to obey immediately. And he's not looking for superpowers. He's looking for surrender. He says to Moses, take off both of your shoes. What's he saying? Moses, I'm about to give you further instruction. And I want you to sign your name to the contract before I even give you the details. How many of you know that's dangerous business? Take off your shoes because I don't need all that other stuff. I just need your surrender. Watch what Moses says in chapter, in, uh, moving forward. He says in the, in the next verse, chapter 4 verse 1, Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. And the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? And he said, a staff. What's in your hand? He said, a staff. And so as you read that chapter, God takes this ordinary tool that was used for his everyday job and he says, throw it on the ground and it becomes a snake. And he picks it back up, it turns back into a staff. He says, take your hand and put it inside your vest there. And he pulls it out and it has leprosy and he puts it back in and he pulls it out and it's clean. The question that I want to ask and the answer that I want to give you this morning is, what does it take to fulfill God's purpose? I'm here to tell you, it's in your hand. It's in your hand. Look at your neighbor say, it's in your hand. And you say, well, God's called me to do something big, but he ha just hasn't given me everything that I need yet. Friend, the only thing that you need to accomplish God's purpose for your life is in your hand. It's in your hand. And you say, what are you talking about? For Moses, it was a staff. For Moses, it was a rod that he used to correct and to prod and to protect the sheep. But for you, it might be a car. It might be a car. It might be that vehicle that you say, well, that's my car. Well, no, friend, God gave it to you. It belongs to him. And something that you use to accomplish an everyday purpose, God could use to transport someone to Journey Church next Sunday where they could experience Jesus Christ. It might be a social media account. And you say, well, that's mine. It's all about me. No, God allows you each breath that you breathe. And if you'll give that to him and you'll use it for his glory and his purpose, the thing that's in your hand can be used to accomplish great and miraculous things. And you say, but pastor, I'm looking at my life and I don't have anything supernatural. There's nothing that belongs to me that's extraordinary. Good news this morning. When you do the natural to the glory of God, he steps in and does the super. And when you do the ordinary to the glory of God, he steps in and does the extra. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever. Everybody say whatever. Whatever you do, do all. Say all. 
all to the glory of God. And so I want to ask you this morning, what's in your hand? What do you have? I don't have much. Instead of looking at all the things that you don't have, examine the blessings that God has given you. What is in your hand? Whatever it is, give it to the Lord this morning because it'll be the thing that he uses to go further than you even and ever expected. What's in your hand? What do I need to accomplish God's purpose? It's in your hand. Watch this. In chapter 4, verse 10, Moses comes back at the Lord and he says, Lord, oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Now, this is the verse that you have heard. This is our Mythbusters episode right here. This is the verse that you've heard preached where someone will say, and we all grew up hearing it. Now, Moses had a stutter. Or they'll say, well, Moses had a, he, he had a slow speech. Moses had a talking problem. We just read how the Holy Spirit inspired that the Bible should record that Moses was mighty in what? Moses didn't have a stutter and he didn't have a speaking problem. Moses had an excuse. He was mighty in what? But he comes back at the Lord and he says, Now, God, I know that you have called me to do this, but God, I, I can't talk very well. And God says, Oh, my word. Seriously? I know that we ask our kids that. We, we ask teenagers that. Sometimes your spouse has asked you that. But I wonder how many times God hasn't listened to my excuse and gone, Really? Moses says, now, God, I, I, I am not eloquent and I'm not a good communicator. The Bible says he was mighty in word. It, myth busted. He didn't have a stuttering problem. What he had was a stupid excuse that he was throwing in the face of God. He didn't have a handicap. Turn to your neighbor this morning and say, it's in your head. The only thing stopping you from fulfilling God's purpose for your life is in your head. And Pastor Vince steps in this, on this platform week by week and casts vision and shows you from the word of God how you can reach people and you can see God do the miraculous and you can sense the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life as you've been studying the last two weeks with Dr. Dale. You've been hearing these things and you've been reading these things and you say, well, that may be true for them, but that's not true for me. This morning, the only excuse that you have, the only thing stopping you, the only thing hindering you is in your head. Look at your neighbor say, it's all in your head. I want you to know that if you come to me and you say, now, pastor, I just, I just don't think that I could do that. I just don't think that I'm capable. I want you to know that I'm going to look at you with the love of Jesus in my heart and a smile on my face and say, bull crap, it's all in your head. Because if God's called you to do something, he is going to give you the tools. What's in your hand and what's in your head that's slowing you down and stopping you? Because disappointments are inevitable. Disappointments are inevitable, but discouragement, friend, this morning is a choice. And we throw excuses in the face of God who doesn't care about our excuses. He's the one who made us. He wouldn't call us to do something if he wouldn't equip us. And lastly, I want you to see this. There in chapter 4, verse 24 and 26, Moses has set out to go to Egypt. He's decided to do what God has called him to do. But have you ever been watching a movie where there's that little, just 30 second scene that doesn't make any sense until the very end. You ever been watching a movie and they, they throw something in there and you go, why, why was that there? You know, and it was a puzzle piece that you'll put together at the end. Right here, Moses, he's loaded up the family, he's headed toward Egypt. It appears that he's doing everything that God's told him to do. But watch this. In verse 24, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Now, didn't we just hear God say, you need to go to Egypt? And Moses said, no. And then God said, no, you will. And he says, yes. And then Moses has an excuse. And God debunks his excuse. And then he gives him Aaron just as an extra token of grace. So now he's on his way to do what God had said to do. And now God appears and tries to kill him. Why in the world? Watch what the Bible says. Then Zipporah, this is Moses' wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, I'm not going to give an anatomy lesson this morning, but I will tell you this. God had placed a specific command on his people and how they were to represent 
holiness and purity and sanctification to him in their body. God had established that. And Moses thought, well, that's my son. And who's going to see? That's hidden. No one will even know. But his son, by the name of Eliezer, means God is my help and my deliverer. Moses, when he named his son, knew that God would be his help and his deliverer. And while his name said God is my deliverer in his body, he did not represent it. In the hidden places, he did not surrender it. And this morning, I want to challenge you with this. It's in your heart. It's all about your heart. This morning, because some of you can be doing the right things on the outside, but have the wrong intention and God not get the glory. Two people can be serving on a volunteer team here, and we thank God for the volunteers at Journey Church. But this morning, two people could do the exact same job, and one do it for the glory of God, and one do it for the glory of themselves, and one receive a gift from God, and one be living in sin. You say, but I was at church. I did the serving thing. I had a smile on my face while I did it. But you did it to be seen. And in the hidden part of your heart where no one could see, well... That was a whole different story. And I want to challenge you, Journey Church, this morning. That God is calling you to great things. God is calling you to reach the city of Hopkinsville for Jesus Christ. And there's no reason why this church could not double, triple, quadruple in size. Here in this city with a number of lost people that have yet to encounter the gospel. There's no reason why you couldn't bring someone with you next week. And there is absolutely no reason why you, friends, in the room this morning and those watching online, could not share your testimony with someone this week and share the gospel with them. And I won't ask you to lift your hands because I think it would be a sad testament to the state of the local church of America today. How many have told someone about Jesus this week? I think we would... Many of us be embarrassed because it's in your heart. And I want you to know that the heart of the matter will always be the heart of the matter. And when the church doesn't grow, it's because we have a heart problem. When sin begins to abound in our lives, it's because we have a heart problem. When the country is in disarray, it's because the church has a heart problem. And to get to the root of every issue that we face, the heart of the matter will always be the heart of the matter. And you cannot show what you have not secretly surrendered. It's in your heart. You cannot show to the world effectively and God will not publicly bless what you have not surrendered within your heart. So this morning, can I ask you, what's in your heart? Do you have a heart to see the world reached? Do you have a heart to grow in your relationship with God? Do you have a heart to engage this community and this culture and see it radically changed? Because that could happen. Or do you have a heart for the status quo? Do you have a heart for you and the things that you like? Where's your heart? What's in your heart? In fact, maybe we ought to ask the question this morning, who is in your heart? Because as we look at our lives, one statistic suggests that over 70% of the membership of local churches in the United States today don't even know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And when we see that six to 10,000 churches close their doors every single year, which means over 300 churches will close their doors today, I see no fruit, which begs the question, was there ever a root? The heart of the matter is always the heart of the matter. So we ask the question, how do I step forward into what God's called me to do? How do I continue? Over the last two weeks, we've seen and, and heard and and, and been taught about what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives and in our spirit. How he can use us and propel us and fill in all of the gaps. And so we ask, how do I practically put that to use? This morning, what's in your hand? Because that's what God has called you to use. Well, it's not much. Well, little is much when God is in it. Because in chapter 4 and verse 20, the thing that was the rod of Moses... As Moses heads toward Egypt, the Bible changes the verbiage a little bit. And it says, and Moses took his wife and his children and the rod of God. It was no longer just an ordinary tool. It was a tool in the hands of God. And this morning, I want to be a handle in the hammer in the hand of God. I want to be 
something that God can use, that the Spirit can fill, a vessel that can be filled up and emptied and poured out and broken so that people can experience what I've experienced. And this morning, that's what God's calling Journey Church to do as well. So I can do more than people expect when I listen to the truth about who God says I am, and that can be scary, but God's will is not as secret and as tricky as some people have made it out to be. What does it take to accomplish God's purpose? It takes what you already have. God has equipped you with everything you need. It's in your hand. Well, what is it that's stopping me? Because I'm just, I'm facing some obstacles and some opposition. Friend, it's in your head. It's in your head. You're not facing, we've blamed the devil for a lot of things that weren't his fault. It's in your head. And this morning, the thing that God wants to make clean, the thing that God wants more than anything, is your authority. He wants all of you. He doesn't need superpowers. He just needs surrender. This morning, it's in your heart. I'd I'd like us to stand together. And this morning, I'm going to have Pastor Vince to come and close the service however he sees fit. But maybe you're in the room and God is calling you to something spectacular and, and miraculous and you know it. But you have been, you've been stepping back. You haven't fully surrendered. This morning, if that's you, and you say, I want to surrender today. I want to take off my shoes and give everything that I am over to God. Not just part of me, I want to give him all of me. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something uncomfortable. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand in just a second. You say, well, people's heads aren't bowed and their eyes aren't closed. You're right. Because we're here as a family to hold one another accountable. And to stir one another up to good works. And so this is not a secret thing. This is an open thing. This morning we're announcing, we're making it public. That all to Jesus I surrender. So this morning if that's you, I'd like to pray for you before Pastor Vince comes to close the service. If you say, today I haven't given God everything, but today I want to. I'm giving myself away. Would you slip up your hand and keep it raised? So that everyone can see. Don't be shy about it. Lift it all the way up. And for those of you that haven't raised your hands, we trust that... You told somebody about Jesus this week. Someone got saved because of your influence this week. In fact, you brought a visitor with you to church today. That's why your hands are down. So those of you with your hands raised, I'm with you this morning. There's things I want to give to the Lord today. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence and in your house. And thank you for placing us here in a church that has a heart and a desire to reach all people and all nations. Father, I pray for those of us with our hands lifted that have things in our lives that you're calling us to surrender so that we can give ourselves fully to the calling that you have placed on our lives. God, all our opposition is, is in our head. Our, our discouragement, it's in our head. God, the tools that you, you want to use are in our hands already. We just haven't given them to you yet. And God, this morning, we recognize the heart of the matter is that we want to give our heart to you. So, Father, for those with their hands lifted, I pray that you would not only give them opportunity this week, but that you would... Help them to be obedient to the opportunities you've already provided. To be a light to this dark and dying world. God, we pray a blessing and we pray revival over the body here at Journey Church. We pray that you would use them to be a lighthouse in this community. That those far from God would be raised to new life in Christ. And that this morning, this would be maybe a a starting point of a revival that you want to see here so that your name could be lifted, so that you could be made famous, and so that your church, so that this building could not contain what you want to do with your people here. Lord, we believe you're coming back too soon for us to waste any time. So this morning, thank you for those with their hands lifted. And Lord, we thank you for those with their hands not lifted, for those that are already doing everything that you've called them to do. And Lord, if there's any in the room that don't know you and those who haven't surrendered but are, are scared or shy this morning... Do whatever it takes. God, keep them miserable until they give their lives to you. God, thank you so much for what you're doing in our presence and and, in this place. And we ask all these things in your son's name. Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and inspire your future. For more information about our church, please visit us at ourjourney.church.